Thanks, Gilbert. Uh, so I'm the publisher of The Independent, meaning I own The Independent. Um, first of all, a very good afternoon to all of you. And I'd like to uh, thank Gilbert for giving me the opportunity to speak. Haven't spoken in Gilbert's event in about three years, I think. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, encore for me, if I can say it. 6.9 million protests. That was the last time I spoke at uh, the rally with him. Um, thanks again for making time on a uh, Tuesday afternoon. You know, instead of spending time with your family, you're here. But I was kind of saddened to hear the stories that were spoken by the speaker just before me about her rights. And that speaks volumes about what's happening in Singapore today. 59 years of independence, or should I say 59 years of author authoritarian rule. And what do we have? Our rights have been appropriated, right? There are no rights. They talk about tripartism or whatever it is. It's a mouthful. But it is a collusion of the government, the union, and the employers. And when you speak of that, who represents your rights today? You can't go to NTUC, and NTUC is not, not the least bothered, right? So, so anyway, the, uh, the union is held by ministers, and today we have a, a minister plus two deputies. They are also ministers. So there's some kind of a, you know, people, strange bedfellows, if you, if you ask me. So before the speech, I was doing some history, and there was a little anecdote in history saying that Lee Kuan Yew wanted the workforce, workers' right to be represented to form a formidable opposition to the colonial rule in Singapore. And soon after mobilizing the, the workforce, what they did, they brought the unions under them. And so we don't have a, a proper representation of your rights today. Also, there are a few other problems that like, I'd like to highlight. Where is the economy heading? Actually, I was very um, through. Was it Mark, is it? Mark, he was talking about his uh, time with Grab. He lost his job and became a Grab driver. And that's about what is happening with all PMETs today. They lose their jobs and they turn to Uber or Grab. And Uber is gone, now Grab. There's an article on The Independent, you can go and check. There was this guy who drove the whole month and he only made zero dollars at the end of the month. Why? Because um, there was one, one passenger had a whiplash and he had to compensate the, the passenger. Um, so if, if you're a driver for Grab, you, you're basically not protected at all. The company doesn't give you any protection. If you really look at where the economy is heading, and a lot of us are going to be part of the on-demand economy. You're not really employees of this group of drivers or, or company, and that's Grab, and you have Airbnb, and, and all these form the on-demand economy. But you're providing your services, right? You don't, do not get CPF, I believe, right? So the situation is going to get worse. And even though the government is speaking about laws for freelancers, that means if you do a job or you perform something for a, a possible a supplier or a, or a vendor, um, you may not get paid. How do you actually protect yourself for that? So what I'd like to do is to say that we need to have greater protection for, for the freelancers and the freelance, the gig economy, they so, so to speak. A couple of other points that I, I'd like to raise today. Josephine Teo, the, the manpower minister, said that the productivity has improved, <laughs> but not borne fruit. So you've, you've got some fruit that's still not ripened yet, right? So whatever that means. So actually, if you really look at the numbers, how do we measure productivity at a national level? You take the whole entire workforce, or you take the div take the GDP divided by the whole workforce, right? And then you can, can look at productivity per employee. But in the years ahead, when, when people are talking in China, Jack Ma is talking about automation. Factories are going to be built based on robots. What does productivity mean? And I'm actually quite puzzled with the government's policy. Why are they still importing foreign talents? When the direction forward is obvious. We can actually go for automation. A lot of jobs can be replaced by automation today. 
So that's one thing that I like to suggest. Instead of supplementing our, our workforce with foreign talent, we can go down the path of um, looking at automation. After the 6.9 million protests, actually I was interviewed by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And one of the things that I said, and I still recall very clearly, is the economy should be adopting high value business, right? And what does that mean, right? High value business. That means if you sell a Boeing jet for a billion dollars and you take maybe 200 engineers to do that, that is a better way forward than to manufacture the very cheap things for 50 cents, but you're taking 2,000 employees to, to, to manufacture and sell that, right? So, so the proposal was, yes, to go down the path. And I actually congratulated the government for, for doing that. And immediately, a week later, I saw Lee Hsien Loong actually going down to Boeing, the factory, taking pictures and you know, saying that, oh, look, you know, this is the direction that we're going to go. And that's what they do, actually. Whenever we bring up a topic, they will go take pictures and say, hey, look, this is the government's idea. Hooray, we've done a great job. And then that's it. There was none, no follow-up after that. We, they didn't bring in a second Boeing or no other big companies, actually. And that was very sad. So we like to have proper accountability. And, and on the forum on Saturday, I actually spoke about the same thing. I also like to bring something. Uh, I think you spoke about companies defaulting on CPF, right? And I explained this in a forum earlier, I think, during the budget discussion. If you, if you really look at it, the historical perspective of CPF, uh, when the British were administering Singapore, the British, the Crown administration, didn't want to subsidize the local population. They didn't want to pay for Singaporeans, Malaysians, or even in India, Indians, and so on. They were really interested in the Angmos, so to speak, right? Because why should they be paying the, the thing? So they wanted to have a very lesser fare. And it's very peculiar for Commonwealth countries, actually. So you only have the employer and employee setting money aside for the future. But in a lot of European countries, retirement is something that the government sets aside money for. And with a lot of money in Tomasek Holdings, GIC, and I was told it's a trillion dollars today, why isn't the government putting money aside, right? Yes, I hear your argument. There's this rich guy driving a 10 Mercedes-Benz, living in a bungalow, not paying a CPF. That is wrong. I agree with you. But if you also look at it, the government does have a responsibility to every citizen. And when you cast a vote, that's what the message you're telling the government. That, hey, look, I'm giving my vote, but protect me. Don't just send me down this rigmarole of administration, you know, go and make a court summons or go and complain to this department. That, that's, that's not protection at all. Um, perhaps transitioning can petition to the, to the manpower minister to suggest uh, some reforms in the CPF as well. Um, the other thing that I was... I was looking at, which, which I mentioned in a, in a forum earlier, is, is the problem of no incentive to innovate. You know, I was kind of heartened to hear the uh, earlier speaker, Serene, talking about how she was you know, very gung-ho, and if you can if you're determined, start a Facebook account, and money will come rolling in. I was quite, you know, quite thrilled about it. I've got, I've got 61,000 followers on Facebook. But I haven't made the $1.3 million. And, but I'll try and make 10 contacts every day and see how that goes. But you know, jokes aside, um, we don't have innovation in Singapore. Grab, formerly known as Grab Taxi, was a Malaysian company. Right? Singapore bought them over. They probably even did a secret deal with Uber to buy them, up, buy them out in Southeast Asia. But where is our innovation in Singapore? Right? And innovation starts with risk-taking. And today, if, if you're really right at the bottom, you're not able to go out and take risk. If you take risk, you f your, you know, the, the, the problems that you face are very punitive, right? You just go down the tubes after that. So we need to have a bit more of a risk-taking culture. That's one. And there's actually a bit of a... Uh, example, actually, Alan Greenspan, the former governor 
um, of Reserve Bank in the US. He has said that countries that have high reserves, right, um, or savings rate, it's a disincentive to innovate. We're not talking about individual pockets here. But if the government has got a lot of money, you know, and it's very cushy, the ministers get paid millions of dollars, there is really no, you know, no risk-taking culture at all, right? All that they do is to try and preserve. It's, it's about self-preservation at the national level, right? And I've also said this on many occasions. The narrative that we have in Singapore, we say that Singapore is capitalistic. Don't compare Singapore with America. We are not America today, actually. America is, yes, capitalistic. They've got entrepreneurs. They've got innovators. They've got a million serenes out there. But in Singapore, we only have serene. You know, you know what I'm saying, right? So uh, what we need to do is to really have more incentives for entrepreneurship and forgive people when they fail. And that means as a culture, we need to, to, to coerce people and nudge them when they fail and say, hey, look, let's do this again. Okay, that's something that I, that, that I like to say. Um, and also, in the budget, Heng Sui Kiat came out, I think earlier they said they've got this um, thing they call transfer, transformation maps. What the hell is the transformation map? You know, you have a bunch of guys who are very highly educated and knowledgeable. They all come around and they say, oh, this is where we want to head five years down the road, 10 years down the road. But remember, you and I are not in that picture of the transformation map, right? So, so when the government talks in big, glossy motherhood statements, you've got to remember that you are and you should be part of that calculation. If not, again, I think you need to make sure your voice is heard. Okay, another point that I like to talk about is, you know, every now and then we talk about meritocratic system. Uh, what is meritocratic system? So you have generals being appointed as, as an ex-CEO. I think there was someone who came up with this particular uh, posting on Wikipedia. You know, the highest ranking officer in Singapore's military is the chief of SMRT. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, 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 now he's the chief of SMRT. He's the highest ranking in, in the military, right? So, so I, it troubles me when our chief of SMRT has to be someone from the military. What, what, um, what skill set does he have? Or what does he know about the transport system? Actually, at, at, that's at the very big top level, right? But at the very microscopic, at the very ground -like level about you and I, and that's possibly a reflection of what is happening on the ground, right? We are all not getting our jobs because there's some kind of favoritism, things that are not spoken out loudly as to how people get their jobs or how they get displaced, all that stuff. And, and actually, we need more accountability and transparency in the system. And, and I also call, and perhaps Gilbert can do that. Uh, again, sorry, uh, uh, there's a lot of bucket list for you to do. Uh, talk about greater uh, transparency for workers, right? And how they're appointed. And maybe the last point that I'd like to touch is the growing income gap. Um, and, and that's really troubling today, right? We have the economy humming along, we are at 38 in terms of GDP. That's it's very $400 billion a year economy. That's huge. But when you look at the poor of the poorest in Singapore, people who have lost their jobs, we're struggling to put food on the table. We're struggling to make ends meet. We're struggling to pay the rent if you're living in a rented flat. There's something that needs to be done for the poor and the displaced, the people that, that that the politicians have conveniently forgotten. And that is one thing that, that I think NGOs like Transitioning, Marua, Marua is here, uh, should work towards in terms of bridging that, that income gap and the gulf. With that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, have a good May Day. Thank you. Yeah,
Thank you. <laughs>